Shove it, man! Shove it, squad. Welcome to your most highly requested YouTube video of the week. So shut up and listen or I'll jab you with my beak. Today's guy is often labelled as one of the biggest missed opportunities in professional wrestling. But after doing some research on forums, there was a different side to this where people complained that he was too green and they didn't like his mannerisms and character. So in today's video, I'll be making a fair and impartial judgement on if he was as big a deal as the narrative goes, or if his time in wrestling blows. We'll be watching his biggest matches, promos and storylines to help us make our minds up. And of course, you already know that a certain someone will be appearing in this video. Quite a lot as it happens. Just a quick reminder to keep it coming with the Barood fundraiser. I'm planning on making a mini documentary on his trials and tribulations on his tour this year and it'd be great if the Shove It squad can ensure that that happens. Also, we're almost at the graceland of 100k subscribers, so make sure you subscribe or I'll rip out your teeth with pliers. Okay, okay, Monty Brown, does he make the Hawk frown? Monty started his career in the NFL. Now, the Hawk isn't going to pretend to know anything about American football, but what I do know is that he competed at the Super Bowl, which is like the WrestleMania of American football, so fair play to him. He eventually had to retire from football due to an ankle injury, and now he needed a new career path. He started training and wrestling in the year 2000 in his late 20s, so a relatively late age to start. He was trained by Dan the Beast Severin and Sabu. You know, a lot of people are trained by jobbers and goons which no one has ever heard of, but you certainly can't knock these trainers. It was only two years later when he'd be making his TNA debut. Monty Brown first showed his face on the third episode of NWA TNA. He announced that he was going for the world title straight away. This was strange for me because he was a relatively unknown guy in the wrestling scene. It sounds to me like TNA were relying heavily on his name recognition from his days in the NFL scene. He showed he had charisma and flashy powerhouse moves straight away, but he didn't do the pounce back in 2002 unfortunately. He got slightly distracted from his world title hunt though as he engaged in a short feud of Elix Skipper. By the 10th episode of TNA he was challenging for the NWA heavyweight title, so I guess this is going to be one of his main matches we should pay some attention to in this video. The champion is the truth, so this isn't exactly what you would expect to see as a main event. I'm not sure if Monty's supposed to be a face or a heel at this point. It's not something Monty's great at, to be honest. As far as nice moves from Monty in this match go, we've got an overhead belly to belly on the outside of the ring. Oh, and the crowd chant football sucks at him. Truth tries to fire up the crowd and turn him against him because I think he's supposed to be the heel, but they aren't really liking Monty at all here. People in the crowd are telling him he sucks at every opportunity. Brown also manages to hit a running power slam and a splash with Truth kicking out of that. Unfortunately, the match ends in a big botch. Monty tries a power bomb, which Truth gets out of by rolling through, but Monty just falls on top of him and the Truth just wins like that. And now it's time for the villain of this episode to appear. Double J, Jeff Jarrett. A wild slap nuts appears. He smashes Brown in the head with a steel chair to show that he wants a world title shot. Of course you want a world title shot, Jeff. He threatened Jeff for hitting him with the chair, but then he said he admired Jeff as he was the chosen one, but said he'd chosen to kick Jeff's ass. I think he didn't realise we weren't in WCW. I have to say he has quite a confident delivery on the mic, but the crowd still hate him. His final appearance to this short TNA run was against Sonny, don't look at my ass Siaki. Monty shows some more Dan Severin style suplexes in this match. Slapnuts appears at ringside allowing Siaki to hit him in the slash zone and rolls him up. Starting to think Jarrett has a real problem with the guy. Monty tries to beat him up but he then sort of fades away as Lawler starts choking Slappy from behind. So that'll be it for Monty for a year and a half in TNA. As far as him being a main eventer at this point, based on this run, yeah I get it, I get why they let him go. The crowd hated him, they just saw him as some sort of football guy. He definitely had potential, but in the early days of TNA they wanted wrestlers to be an instant hit, because they needed it. He wasn't so they let him go, Monty went back to the indies. When Monty returned to TNA in 2004, not much seemed to have changed. He was wearing a football shirt and he attacked the insane clown posse. His first backstage interview was great. I'm not really sure what he was talking about, but it sounded good. Why? Why am I here, Scott Hudson? Because I can be. Because I'm the alpha male. We ain't going chicken hunting. We ain't going chicken hunting. Ain't no chicken hunting going on around here. And they want to boo me for beating down some clowns? Half the people out there can't even spell boo. Pounce. Period. He ended the promo telling his next opponent he will feel the pounce, period. This is how he would end most of his TNA promos. So that's a great start from an entertainment standpoint. His first match back was against the Jobber, and another new change for Brown was he was now wearing leopard print trunks. He hit his first pounce in TNA in his first match back. It's obviously inspired from his football career, and sometimes his opponents can flip through the air, making it look like a really fun move to watch. 
He also hit his alpha bomb and attacked the jobber after the match, so I guess he's a hill or he's just a dick. All his promos seem to have a hunting theme to them. He's calling TNA his hunting ground. For me, it's impressive how quickly he's dominating on the microphone. I think Brown is a severely underrated promo. He manages to be funny and intimidating at the same time. This is my hunting ground. It is not rabbit season. It's not duck season. It's open season. The most feared man on this hunting ground. I learned something new about his persona from this video. He always does that thing during his entrance where he rubs his face against the ropes. Turns out he's marking his territory. His first proper feud back was against Sabu. This was an incredibly hard hitting feud with Sabu leg dropping him through a table on the outside of the ring in a match. Despite that, the match still went to a no contest because it got out of control. They moved on to competing in a Fool's Count Anywhere match. This was another really fun one. I especially enjoyed Sabu throwing a chair at Monty and it getting stuck on his head. Monty retaliated by smashing him in the face of a chair and also giving him a top rope powerbomb. Monty hitting the pounce sends Sabu out of the ring. Sabu tries to leg drop him for a table later in the match, just like the previous one, but Monty moves and Sabu is still able to adjust his dive and he catches him. In the crowd, Monty hits Sabu with a fall away slam into a pile of chairs. Another table is added to the match now as they head out into the old SEX locker room. For some reason, Monty doesn't emerge, instead it's Abyss who powerbombs Sabu through the table. Monty isn't scared of Abyss, but he leaves anyway. Monty hits another pounce on Sabu to win this one. These two have styles which blend together really nicely. Monty went undefeated for his first few months at TNA, beating wrestlers such as Sonny, Don't Look At My Arsiaki, D'Lo Brown and MVP, then going as Antonio Banks. His pounce finisher was really over the crowd already at this point. You could hear murmurs of it in the crowd just like before the Duddies would hit a 3D. Due to his undefeated run, he came into the crosshairs of Slapnuts, who was of course the champion as usual. Monty was cutting yet another amazing promo making fun of his competition. This guy sort of reminds me of The Rock with his humorous promos. During the promo, Jarrett walked up and stole some of his lines and said he'll never be a champion. Monty retaliated by doing a Jeff Jarrett impression. It was this point that I realised he had the promo ability to be a star. Have you been studying, Scott? Your grasp of the obvious is amazing! Dino Brown, you and I are as different as night and day! You in the house the alpha male or let me change the vernacular you Dino the alpha male I am the supreme being I don't care if it's Ken Shamrock Lion's Den there's only one lion in that den and he's the alpha male I wouldn't care if it's B Jizzle I wouldn't care about the truth this is the truth but the crowd I don't think they brought into the Serengeti gimmick yet. It's never clear if he's a face or a heel. Let's see if that changes. With his undefeated run still going, he was shoved in a number one contenders match against Jeff Hardy in his second ever TNA match. I'm going to give this match a bit more focus. This is one of his major ones from his TNA run. Hardy seems to have his number in the early going, causing Monty to take a chill pill on the outside. Monty eventually gains a foothold in the match by hitting a double underhook suplex. Monty was suplexing him all over the place. Jeff eventually reverses one of his suplex attempts into a hurricanrana. Then Monty does catch Jeff with the alpha bomb and we get a double down. Later on Jeff looks to put him away with a swanton bomb but a wild slap nuts appeared for some reason to save Monty. This annoyed him. He got back into the ring and tried the pounce but he gets rolled up for the free. The streak is over and Monty's spot in the main event has been taken by Jeff Hardy. Monty pounced Hardy after the match so it seems like they might have something going on him and slap nuts. It's probably just Jeff Jarrett playing wrestling politics as usual. A few months later, Monty and Hardy clashed again in another one contenders match. This match wasn't as good. We got a ref bump and Hardy hit the swanton bomb on Monty. Abyss attacked Hardy for an earlier loss because he's a bad loser. Monty pounced Abyss away but then Raven appeared and hit Monty with a chair and gave him the Raven effect. This was also for an earlier loss. Hardy hit the twist of fate to win the match, so it seems like Jarrett isn't the only Jeff that Monty has a problem with in TNA. Despite the loss, Monty continued in the upper mid-card of TNA, beating the likes of Raven and Abyss. The crowd seemed to be fully behind Monty at this point as a good guy. He had an impressive showing at Victory 2004, showing that he had the strength to dominate his bigger opponents. He'd still only been beaten twice at this point, both times by Jeff Hardy, so you can't really say he wasn't booked strongly. This guy had some mad strength, the crowd love him. Who's ready to get angry? The next 5 minutes of this video are sure to make your piss boil. Monty Brown managed to get his first one-on-one -on -one shot at Jarrett on an episode of Impact. Unfortunately, Brown is going into this one with injured ribs. 
Jarrett works his ribs for a long portion of time before Monty is able to throw him with a suplex. Monty also gets a two count off a power slam. Monty also hits the alpha bomb with Slapnuts getting his shoulder up at two. Then we get an actual ref bump that I like. Yeah, I know it's rare. Monty hits a fall away slam but throws Slapnuts into the referee. Whilst the ref is down, Jarrett smacks him with his stupid guitar. Monty amazingly no-sells it so Jarrett gives him the stroke and Monty somehow kicks out of that one. The crowd felt his time was now and nothing could stop Monty from becoming the world champion at this point. Monty hits the pounce on Jarrett but then one of the kings of wrestling, Scott Hall aka Elvis is in the ring. Monty pounces him away. Monty's distracted and that leads to Jarrett hitting him twice with a chair and that's how this one ends. The crowd looked pissed but there's worse to come. So the fans are now truly behind Monty, it's time for probably his biggest night in TNA next, Final Resolution 2005. At this pay per view a triple threat number one contenders match took place, the winner would receive a shot at Slapnuts world title later in the night. This one is contested under pinfall and being eliminated over the top rope rules. It's Kevin Nash vs DDP vs Monty Brown. Monty gets the best crowd reaction which is impressive when you also have Paige in the match. The older guys seem to have a pack to take out Monty first. He manages to fight off an early diamond cutter attempt before sending Paige out of the ring. Paige seems a bit intimidated so Nash takes his turn. Monty also overpowers the bigger Nash, maybe these two old idiots should attack him at the same time. Nash proves me wrong though and takes Monty out on his own and gives him a side slam. What do I know, I'm just a stupid bird with a Hawk Hogan face smashed on top of it. Monty fights back by backdropping Nash so now DDP decides he'll take his turn again. Paige manages to clothesline him down a couple of times but he can't get the free. Brown also hits DDT but Nash breaks up the pin as he still wants to work with Paige. The two old guys start double teaming for the first time before DDP then randomly throws Nash over the top rope to eliminate him. DDP pretty quickly hits the diamond cutter but Nash is still here being livid and he attacks Paige. Monty almost beats him now with a small package. DDP takes his turn to almost win again with a roll up. He comes even closer to winning with a lariat. Monty manages to wake up now and he strings together some offence. He gives DDP a fall away slam and a power slam. Paige is still able to kick out. Later on Paige attempts a running diamond cutter which Monty fights off and keeps running and he hits the pounce on Paige. Not a great match but the right man wins so all good overall but the WCW gauntlet will continue now as he'll face Slapnuts later in the night for the title. So here it is, later in the night we get the main event of Monty Brown challenging for the Slapnuts belt. Both guys start shoving whilst JB tries to announce the match. I don't think there's a single person in the arena who doesn't want Monty to win. Jarrett doesn't want to play the power game and does an arm drag instead. He starts strutting around the ring which really upsets the crowd. Jeff continues winning the opening exchange and being cocky. Jarrett stupidly abandons his previous game and tries to compete with strength and it doesn't work and Monty gives him a body press slam. Monty wants to hit a fall away slam but Jarrett rakes his eyes and runs it in but Monty quickly snaps off a nice snap slam. The crowd chant next world champion. Monty gets overzealous now and charges at Jarrett but he pulls down the ropes. Slappy strangely tries a slingshot to the outside and Monty's supposed to catch him but he doesn't really manage it. He picks him up and slams him anyway. Monty tries to power him again but Jarrett slivers away and he sends him into the ring pole. Jarrett's now at full control and he goes to his usual game of crowd brawling and weapon shots, he's at home here. Jarrett drops Tanae's commentary chair onto the alpha male which upsets the long time bolting commentator. They come back to the ring now with Jarrett trying a sleeper, it doesn't work and Monty tries it on him. Then Monty comes close to winning with a small package. There's a double down now as both guys heads smash together. When they get up Monty's in full control and he hits the alpha bomb for a two count. Monty also hits a neck breaker which he apparently calls the circle of life. Slappy tries to stroke next but Monty shoves him off which causes a ref bump. Because every Jeff Jarrett match in TNA history has a ref bump. He gets his little guitar and smashes Monty in his head. He stays on his feet for a few seconds before collapsing. When Jarrett makes the cover Monty does kick out. Jarrett also has a chair now but Monty picks him up on his shoulders. Jarrett still has the chair in his hands and hits Monty in the face. Monty collapses backwards but somehow Jeff makes the pin. How? He was the one who got slammed to the mat. Jeff continues his weapons assault on Monty but he kicks out of the pin with authority. The crowd are going skits for Monty, they really want to see a new world champion. The alpha male tries a pounce which slappy dodges causing yet another ref bump. Jarrett grabs another guitar and he jumps with it from the second rope. Monty stops him and choke slams him. The alpha male now has a guitar and he hits Slappy in the head with it. The ref's still out though. Monty makes the cover but it's just the two due to the long wait. The crowd chant bullshit. Monty tries another pounce now but he's hit with another guitar shot because the two idiot referees are busy cuddling on the floor. Jarrett now hits two strokes, a kick to the nutsack and another stroke. 
We certainly got all four moves of Jeff Jarrett's special attacks in this match. Monty Brown is beaten and it ends. Jarrett has argued since that it's okay because Monty was well protected by how much it took to beat him here. Here's an idea, if you want to make Monty look strong, why not, you know, let him beat you. Jarrett had nothing to lose and Monty had everything to gain from this match. It'll continue to get worse for the Alpha Male now. For some strange reason at Destination X, Monty Brown decided to interfere in a match between DDP and Jeff Jarrett. He helped Jarrett win and retain the title. So how does Monty explain this heel turn? Well, he didn't really get a chance to explain himself because Jarrett did it for him. It was basically that Jarrett promised him a title shot. And just like that, Monty was just another guy blending into the background. It wasn't just that though, Jarrett was now describing them as friends. Why would anyone want to be friends with Jeff Jarrett? Monty said him and Jarrett and Billy Gunn were going to take over the world and take TNA to another level. Straight away, losses followed the previously virtually unbeatable Monty Brown. He soon lost to the likes of X-Pac and AJ Styles. On the whole, Brown did win most of his matches, but unfortunately they were all in the mid-card at this point. In this Hawks opinion, Monty Brown just doesn't work as a heel. He cuts funny promos that you want to watch and he has his pounce finisher that you want to cheer. Jarrett lost the belt without giving Monty a shot, so five months later Monty announced he was no longer going to do Jarrett's dirty work. Too little too late, he should have smacked him in the gut. Separating himself from Jarrett helped him almost immediately. He finally managed to beat Jeff Hardy and he did it cleanly, and at the time he became the number one contender for the world title again. Unfortunately for Monty, Christian Cage debuted in TNA. This completely derailed plans for Monty Brown. Christian got Monty to put his number contendership on the line at Turning Point 2005 and Monty lost the match to Christian. What a punch to the gut that is. Monty's more of a tweener at this point but the fan reaction has definitely called for him. That's what happens when you don't pull the trigger at the right time and have him be slap nuts little lackey. Oh, Jarrett and Monty Brown formed another agreement. This time they were both unhappy of TNA management for bringing in the Dudleys, Christian and Rhino. In other words, they were scared of the competition. The crowd booed at this decision, but honestly at this point it doesn't really matter. He's now just another guy in a faction. Monty Brown dressed up as Sting so Jarrett could further his feud with the Stinger Steve Borden. He also had a baby Sting in a pushchair. This was not the Monty Brown we were used to seeing. Monty said that's how we stroll as he pushed the baby around the ring. Brown had his final shot at TNA Gold at Destination X 2006 against the champion Christian. Highlights of this one include Brown reversing a tornado DDT by just throwing Cage through the air like he was nothing. Christian turning around the match by hitting the spinning heel kick when Monty was about to pounce. Christian also misses the frog splash. This leads to Monty body press dropping Christian on the turnbuckle. Christian fought him back on the top rope and hit him with a back sent on for a two. Straight after this, Brown reverses the Unpredator into the Alpha Bomb for a two of his own. Brown also gives us a new move here similar to Sean O'Hare's Widowmaker. He tries to follow it with the pounce but Christian kicks him in the face and puts him away at the Unpredator. As soon as the match ends, Slapnuts comes out and announces that he's going to take Christian's belt from him, because he has to upstage Monty. Now I would normally call it a day on TNA at this point, but I haven't found what I would definitively call his best TNA match, and I have a sneaking suspicion that his best is yet to come and has gone under the radar. So here it is, this is Monty's second to last TNA match and it took place at Hard Justice 2006. A triple threat between Monty, Rhino and Samir Joe and the No DQ Falls Count Anywhere rules. The match spills out the ring almost straight away of Rhino smashing down on Monty from the ring. Joe immediately hits Rhino with a suicide dive. He can't celebrate for long though as Monty starts smashing people with a trash can. Joe no sells and punts the trash can into the alpha male's face. Joe takes out Rhino by smashing his face into a cardboard wall. They try to come back to the ring but out of nowhere Monty Brown flies over the crowd barrier to take them out. This cardboard wall is taking a battering tonight. They have a really good crowd brawl and I admittedly don't normally like crowd brawls but this one was intense. Speaking of intense, this match also has some of the most intense weapon shots in TNA history. They make it back to the ring area where Rhino hits a snap suplex to Monty on the entrance ramp. Rhino also takes Joe out of a belly to belly. Rhino gets stopped by Monty who gives him a double underhook on the ramp. The ref's out of position comes sliding down the ramp to count. Monty almost beats Joe as well with a drop kick on the outside. Rhino then creams Monty with some more weapon shots and gets him in the ring. Joe also joins them in the ring where Joe hits Monty with a flying kick and a trash can sent on. No one's down for long in this match though as Rhino almost wins with a spine buster on the chair. Joe almost wins again then with a power bomb on a chair before Monty drags him out of the ring and hits him with a trash can. The alpha male sets up a table on the outside of the ring and he has bad intentions for Joe. He tries a suplex but he can't manage it as Joe chops him away. This one's so back and forth as Monty hits the net breaker on Joe on the top of the ramp. Monty wants to hit the pounce now but Rhino's back with the trash can lid shots. 
Rhino sets up a couple more tables on a wall. He then tries to gore Monty who sidesteps him and Rhino flies off the ramp and goes through his two tables that he set up. The match suddenly ends as Samur Joe sends Monty through the other table with an STO off the ramp. This wasn't a match I was aware of and it's nice to see these sort of surprises from making these videos. Find and watch this one now. Actually, finish this video first. Monty Brown had his final match on Impact the following week, a one-on-one -on -one with Rhino, but it went to a no contest and Monty was never seen in TNA again. I want to end this part of the video on some recent quotes from Jeff Jarrett about why Monty was never a world champion. I've picked out some specific bits relative to the video. And to quote, When we got into contract negotiations and he knew he wanted to see if the grass was greener, the time was right. I was working with the stinger, Steve Borden. There were different storylines that revolved around the belt. Later on in the interview, he went on to say, I could tell guys like Monty. Monty, you're not ready to carry the ball by yourself. You're just not. There's some truth in what Jarrett says here. By the time 2005-2006 came around, it was too late for Monty. Too many bigger stars were jumping over from the WWE and he didn't have a chance. The time was right for me at Final Resolution 2005. The crowd were firmly behind it and ready to see him as champion. Christian and Rhino hadn't signed yet and AJ Styles wasn't really seen as a main eventer at this point. The spot was open and that was his time. They were lacking main eventers so just do it alright. Anyway, we ain't done yet. In November 2006, Monty Brown did indeed find out if the grass was greener as he signed a contract with the WWE. He was given the name of the alpha male Marcus Corvon as the WWE wanted to be able to own his name. He was put on the ECW brand. He made his debut against Casty O'Reilly so strange it was two ex-TNA guys fighting. There was of course no mention of this, apart from some TNA chants in the crowd. He still used the pounce, but for some reason he ended the match with an armbar. Oh, and he has stupid jazz music too. It was literally the next episode of ECW, which is strangely missing from the network, when Vince McMahon turned up on ECW. He throws the ECW originals under the bus, saying that they suck, and he singled out praise for some of the younger ECW talents. Monty was one of those talents. Vince told him he was like a breath of fresh air. And this was how... The new breed went on a pretty decent run and went undefeated against the ECW crew for a while. Monty mainly teamed with Kevin Thorne. Could you think of two less likely people to be hanging around together? It looks so stupid. Throughout the footage I watched, I want to point out this pounce that Monty hit on Sabu. It looks brutal. Best I've seen. Corvon did actually get to appear in a match at WrestleMania 23, which surprised me. It was only an eight-man tag, the new breed versus the originals. You know what, I'm shocked this match wasn't put on the pre-show. It was pointless anyway because Corvon struggled against Tommy Dreamer. His other actions were clotheslining RVD and then Sabu diving on him. It looked like he fell on his head. RVD won, moving on quickly. There are two matches I'd like to focus on as I think they'll give us a view on how Corvon was developing as a wrestler. The first is a singles match against RVD. Neither man could land a strike to begin with but Corvon does eventually start battering Rob. RVD tries to fight back with a monkey flip, which Corvon looks like he's going to counter with an alpha bomb, but Van Damme just snaps off a hurricanrana just about. Corvon quickly shuts him down with a clothesline. It's pretty basic stuff here. Corvon does a scoop slam and goes to the submission game. It's just not as exciting as his time in TNA. RVD tries to fight back again, but he's nailed with a net breaker for a two count. Rob suddenly does a body scissors into a pin, but it's not enough. Brown regains control of a backdrop suplex. Then it improves as Corvon hits a released German suplex, probably the nicest move I saw in his ECW run, other than the pounce on Sabu. Monty hits a snap suplex and goes back to the submission game. It feels like WWE want him to do more submissions than his time in TNA. There's been four attempts already in this match. Corvon seems to have an answer for all of RVD's counters. He's surprisingly all over him. Fifth submission now. RVD fights it off and hits a Superman punch and some clotheslines. Rob knocks him down for a spinning kick and a springboard thrust kick. RVD then does a double leg and a corkscrew leg drop. Corvon tries to halt his progress by sending him out of the ring, but RVD holds on and dives from the top with a thrust kick. Burke attacks Sabu on the outside of the ring, which completely distracts Rob. He tries to chase him through the ring just as Monty charges at Rob and gives him the pounce. Straight after the match, CM Punk comes out and joins the new breed, but he looks like he's constipated. They hoist Punk in the air in celebration. Just like that, Monty's win over RVD has been completely forgotten and overshadowed. Nothing to really write home about in this match, but you'd have thought it would have been better, actually. The second match I wanted to check out is a singles match against Punk. Corvon knocks Punk down to zero reaction from the crowd. Punk retaliates with a heel kick and a drop kick. Corvon drags him out of the ring and starts smacking him. Marcus quickly picks Punk up and powers him into the ring pole. The match is now back in the ring where Corvon puts on a bear hug. Punk a backbreaker for a two count. He puts on another bear hug and then he throws Punk overhead with a belly to belly. It's just another two. 
CM Punk eventually turns it around and sending Corvon into the corner and gives him a bulldog. Punk also hits a net breaker, but he seems to be really hurting here. Despite that, Punk hits a springboard clothesline. CM Punk tries to give a tornado DDT from the top, but it's countered and Corvon throws him out of the ring. Burke cheats on the outside, but Punk makes it back into the ring at 9. Then Monty Brown hits the pounce and it's over. Monty Brown just beat CM Punk. I have to say it's a bit like watching Monty Brown from his first TNA run in 2002. He's got some moves, but not much character. He's just a guy and that's a damn shame. The new blood eventually ended, but Corvon and Burke continue to be associated. It's like the TNA missed opportunity tag team. Someone name this team for me. His final match was a loss to CM Punk in June 2007. The match featured a bad botch where Corvon struggled to turn Punk's dive into a snap slap. It looked ugly. I've seen a lot of guys diving on Monty throughout this video. For him, there seemed to be a bit of a problem with this spot. Punk won with the go to sleep. And that was it for Monty for his wrestling career. His sister sadly passed away and Monty made the unselfish decision to hang up his wrestling boots and look after her children. This has been a really long video for me, but I believe at the start of this thing I said my aim was to find out if he was truly a big deal or if he was overrated. I've certainly watched enough Monty Brown now to make that call. Well, give me the Monty Brown for 2004-2005 and you're surely on to a winner. It was definitely bad booking that let him down. But all that being said, I can't imagine that if he'd stayed in TNA, things would have changed. You had Kurt Angle joining soon, Booker T, RVD, Mr. Anderson, Jeff Hardy, Bobby Roode becoming a star and AJ coming back to the main events. And don't forget about the Hawk. He didn't want the Pope to win the world title, so did Monty have a chance? That's a whole video for another day. I can't make that assumption. The point being, Monty's star and TNA faded, and it would have only faded more as time went on. The damage was done. So yeah, to answer my original question, he was a massive missed opportunity to us. But was he a missed opportunity to the TNA company? I'm not sure that he was. They would have plenty of main eventers just after this. My prediction is if he'd have got the belt and would have become a TNA champion, he'd have been similar to an abyss. A guy they can feature prominently, but TNA were never going to build the show around him. And that's not saying that I agree with that. I thoroughly enjoyed watching all these matches and promos. He's great. Monty featured regularly on the TNA show for two and a half years, but would putting the belt on him really have boosted their audience? I'm not sure it would have. His time in ECW sucked. I'm sorry, he was boring and it felt like he lost his swagger and it was pointless. I don't have much to say about it. He was in a faction and it was never about him, so he wasn't going to succeed. This video is getting out of control, so let's just end on a Taz factoid, because I just love segments. I got a factoid for both of you guys. I got a boil on my ass. It's all Slapnut's fault, and if you don't agree with that, I'll give you wounds and rubbing salt.